Alaska is famous for being cold, isolated, and for paying people just to move there. But is it worth it? Because apparently moose are being found torn apart in Alaska. And I think I'm going to stay far away from any place where creatures exist that can tear apart moose, even if you paid me. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails. And you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails, where you can see this downright awful picture of a hand with no fingernails. Yikes, that'll be me if I don't stop chewing them off. Today's episode features an assortment of wonderfully scary stories of the unknown, from haunted dolls to Alaskan monsters. Enjoy! And by the way, I need you to scare the heck out of me. I mean it. If you've ever experienced something unexplained, send it to me at darkstories.org and scare the socks off of me so I can share your story on this show. Thank you. By the way, if I added my cryptid card game to Tabletop Simulator, do any of y'all know what that is? And if you do, would you want to join a stream where I teach you how to play it? Just wondering. Now, let's begin. The Squintna, Alaska Happenings from Quillback I grew up in a rural community in the Squintna area of Alaska, a place that doesn't often appear on maps. Its only claim to fame is being a place the Iditarod passes on the way to Nome. It isn't a town or even a village, rather a scattered community of homesteaders, apocalypse preppers, lodge operations, and wealthy southerners with summer retreats, all spread for miles up and down the river. It tends not to be a very frightening place, though it can be dangerous. Whether hostile wildlife or smash-and-grab criminals, if you know how to handle it with a rifle, there's nothing to be afraid of. Yet, as long as I've lived out there, I have had an uncanny fear of being out in the woods alone. My family has a homestead nearby a large marsh. Ever since I was a child, I could see that expanse of grass and water outside my window. It could be mesmerizingly beautiful watching the wind ripple through that sea of grass, but at the same time, there was always something off-putting or eerie about it, especially when night came. Alaska is known as the place of the midnight sun during the summer. It never really gets dark, unlike the winter. Instead, everything gets suspended in a drawn-out dusk until morning breaks again. The sun falls just enough below the horizon that the sky grays and all the colors become muted with less definition. But there's still enough light to see everything, to make out shapes, the perfect conditions to make you think you're seeing things. I'd be looking out my window, watching the mist roll over the now still grassy expanse, thinking I could almost make out things moving on the far side of the marsh. I would always dismiss it. Moose are frequent and love to browse the aquatic vegetation there. And yet, there was always a fear. A fear I could not rationalize or explain. I didn't know where it came from. When I was young, I attributed the fear to bears. After all, there were many cases of hungry grizzlies breaking into cabins and attacking people in their beds. This actually happened to one of our neighbors, a story I might share another time. Later, my family had to put down a problem bear that had been breaking into our garbage shed. With it lying dead before me, I realized that maybe bears weren't behind this unknown terror. This strange irrational dread went on for many years, until I was old and big enough to be allowed to go out on my own. It subsided with the newfound freedom I gained. I could go wherever I wished, whenever I wished. I could explore, and I did, as many children do. I tromped around the woods. I would usually be armed with a big axe, bear spray, and a twenty-two. The area we built on was raised with a steep wooded slope that ended at the edge of the marsh. These slopes encircled at least half of the marsh before it flattened out on the other side. I typically paraded around on the highlands, never really venturing down these slopes to the marsh. The year 2016 was when it began, or perhaps it had always been, 
and I was only just then noticing. There's a big trail that overlooks the marsh. It's where we had long ago pushed old stumps and rotten logs, debris from trail creation, off the side of the slope, creating kind of a giant ball of dirt and tangled wood that one could stand on to overlook the marsh. I was speeding by at the time on a four-wheeler, and I just happened to look in that direction. And when I did, there was something there. Something standing in the trail by the debris pile. To this day, I almost chalk it up to me seeing things, but I felt it should be included. I went by so quick I never really got a good look at it. It looked like it wasn't really there, like an apparition of some kind. An enormous hunched body suspended on thin emaciated legs with long spindly arms reaching out to its side. It was gray, gray like a dark cloud. It had a big neck and a huge snouted head. There wasn't enough definition to the body and I was going too fast to see much of anything else. After I'd passed it, I stopped and backed up to see if I could catch a glimpse of it again. There was nothing to see. I ruminated on that sighting. All I could think of was some enormous bipedal moose or wolf. It couldn't have been a bear. Bear's limbs are quite thick and stocky, not long and emaciated. The fear returned, and this time I felt like I knew where it was coming from. Since 2016, there have been happenings, perhaps brought on by my own foolishness. The next year, I sought to conquer my fear, saying to myself I was only seeing things, and if it was an animal, it was only an animal. A friend was staying with me at the time, and I invited him on a squirrel hunt with me, an excuse for me to go down where I saw that thing, and in the adjacent area, prove to myself that there was nothing to fear, with a friend for backup. I regret having dragged him down there now. It was pretty scummy of me, now that I think about it. Armed with axes, spray, and rifles, we went down the slope the debris pile was on. It was quiet. There were no squirrels chattering in the trees, no chickadees chirping. Even the ever-present mosquitoes lessened and quietened. The only sound was us wading through the bush. Toward the bottom of the debris pile at the marsh's edge, we came across a bone, a femur belonging to something. We didn't think too much of it. After all, you'll find bones every now and then, especially out in the bush. But eventually we found more. A whole moose carcass, picked clean and scattered around the base of the debris pile. Its ribcage lay derelict, bleached by the sun, still interconnected by dried cartilage. We both thought it interesting, stopping to examine the remains. It was old. There was no smell. Perhaps one or two years had passed since its death. As we sat there over the bones, we looked behind us, noticing that the pile of debris had several tunnels dug through it into the side of the slope. Dense tufts of moose hair littered around it. Perhaps a bear had dug its den here. Wisely, we decided to leave, moving horizontally along the slope away from those tunnels. The dread began to seep back into me, though. I powered through it, making excuses. Maybe a bear had eaten the moose and hibernated there a long time ago, I thought to myself. But as we progressed, things became, well, uncanny. Along the slope, there were many well-worn trails going alongside it which we walked on to avoid bushwhacking. No discernible tracks could be made out, but there were definitely signs of moose, where they had stripped off leaves and bark to eat, and large patches of flattened grass where something had bedded down. Eventually, we came across another carcass, more intact this time, its bones less scattered. Likely only one winter since it died. Its skeletal body was covered in the crunchy shells of dead insects and maggots. Weird. And its neck had been snapped. One of its vertebrae cleanly broken like someone breaking a carrot in half. We thought it strange and moved on. As we went, 
we began to notice that every so often by the side of the trail, there was a young aspen or poplar sapling bent over with a log or something holding down its top like the log had been placed there to keep it bent over. We found places where there were multiple saplings bent over to array in strange patterns, like one after the other in a row. Growing more unnerved, we continued, eventually seeing little sticks all laid around the base of a bigger tree, like a tiny teepee. At that point, we noped out of there, heading back to the house. We got back inside and were just taking off our jackets and shoes when it happened. There was a howl or a deep moan, something like that. I struggled to describe it, but it was so deep, so loud, I could feel it in my chest, like it rattled my very lungs. The only thing I can really liken it to was when I was at a military air show and the F-15s did a low flyby over the attendees. The jolt and the air reverberating in your lungs is something that you just can't forget. This howl boomed once, and that was it. I felt that whatever it was, was telling us, I know where you've been, and I know where you live. My buddy and I were shaken, but we both came to the excuse of, did you hear that howl? It had to have been a wolf or something. But when we looked at each other, we both knew darn well it was no wolf. After this trek down the slope, there's been things happening. We'll find moose carcasses increasingly close to our house, with most being yearling calves, which are about the size of horses, and we never hear any fight or commotion, so it's assumed that whatever kills them drags their carcasses close to our place, and every time it's the same. The neck is snapped, sometimes with the head detached. One time in the winter, we went out to the shed to find a moose head sitting in the doorway, its decapitated body just off to the side of the building. It's been a while, and I may be misremembering, but we might have also found a leg in a tree as well. And every time, it's the same procedure. We burn or dispose of the carcass so our dogs don't get into it. We heard one of the neighbors had something big trying to dig under his house while he was gone one evening. All his dogs had been huddled under the cabin when he came back. He found massive claw marks and overturned earth at the edge of his home. He had to coax his own dogs out, letting them sleep in the house with him. A couple of nights later, one of his dogs went missing. A bear? Maybe. I'd find strange tracks I wouldn't know what to make of, one or two in the middle of the trail, with no discernible trackway, even what looked like semi-human handprints in the mud of a nearby lake bottom. I don't know what to make of this. A lot of it can kind of be explained away by coincidences. But the one thing that sold this for me was when I was alone one night at the house in an upstairs bedroom. I was reading a book in bed when I heard something outside. Something was running around on the lawn. I got up out of bed to go take a look, and I hear this massive whack as if something just hit the side of the house. I freeze, hearing something running around with loud, ragged breathing. I turn off my lights and lock the door. The breathing continues heaving and panting, gargling breaths. I ended up recording a little on my phone, but due to the crappy audio, I couldn't really make it out over the sound of a clock ticking in the background. I gathered my courage and peeped out the window. Nothing there, but it sounded so close. It had stopped running, and all I could hear was that breathing. Yet, try as I might looking out the window, I saw nothing. No movement, not anything. It was as if whatever it was hugged the side of the house under the eaves to stay hidden from my view. The breathing slowed to the occasional huff and pant. Then, as suddenly as it had come, it just stopped. The next morning, I found a large poplar stick with a long indentation in the house paint. Whatever it was, 
had hit the side of the house with a stick, which must have been the whack I heard. Since that night, with the breathing and the stick, there have been no more carcasses. Life has gone relatively back to normal. I have reluctantly gone back down over the slope, looking for property markers. The bones are gone, and the tunnels in the debris pile have collapsed or eroded. Thankfully, nothing came of me going down there. Other than that, it's been quiet. I don't know, maybe I'm going crazy, making connections between things that aren't really connected. My fear has subsided. It's smaller, but still there in the back of my mind whenever I'm alone in the woods. I do have some pictures of the marsh and some bones, a sketch of the apparition and the last moose carcass that was left by our place. These will be linked in the description. These were just my personal experiences, but I've heard some other non-related scary Alaskan stories from friends, if you're interested. Nightmare in the Old Steel Mills of Youngstown, Ohio From Matt E. I had a horrifying experience when I was 14 years old. I live in Youngstown, Ohio. I grew up in the north side of the city. If you look up pictures of the old steel mills in town, you'll get an understanding of what I'm talking about. My buddy literally lived across the street from the mills. We would regularly go down there and just investigate the massive area. It was all but shut down and dilapidated. Well, we had certain old buildings that we frequented, and one we made into our home base. We spent weeks making walls and strengthening spots so no one could get in, especially the wild dogs that also frequented the area and were quite vicious. They traveled in packs of six or more. The building we went to all the time had no stairs, so we had to jump up to get in. Made it safer for us. The place was right by an active railroad, the other working steel mill nearby used it to get supplies in and out. Fast forward to the summer. We were exploring the mills one night. We always had guns as this was Youngstown, Ohio in the late 80s. Murder Town, USA at the time. Plenty of gang activity. We had chosen an old factory building that was huge. We would even have big fires right on the floor of the first floor. We erected a wall of these metal U-shaped things. Looking back on it now, I think they were milling shields, which gave us privacy and safety. If anyone saw us from the railroad, they would call the police and security, so we would be in a lot of trouble otherwise. Well, we were hanging out, and we heard a pack of dogs coming. This time, we thought it sounded like they were chasing something. We sneakily went out to sea. They ran past us over a huge mound of coke, that steel mills use in the steel making process. We then heard a fight ensue, some sort of vicious attack, all the dogs involved. After six to seven seconds, we heard a louder dog above all the others, and the beginning screams of the wild dogs began. To our shock, at different times, the wild dogs were literally being thrown over the mound in different directions. Finally, the pack of wild dogs ran away in the direction they came from, but as fast as they could possibly run, some of them limping with obvious injuries. We were shocked. Then one of my friends screamed, What is that? At that moment, I kid you not, this huge, and I mean colossal, wolf-like animal, the size of which seemed honestly fake, crawled on all fours to the top of the mound. It looked directly into the area the dogs ran off to. It lifted its leg and proceeds to release a urine flow that seemed like it was released out of a garden hose. That right there may sound amusing, but it scared the absolute heck out of us. I mean, you have no idea how big this thing actually was. My one buddy stumbled backwards into our makeshift wall. When it heard that, it immediately turned its attention to us. I can't relate to you the amount of fear we all instantly felt. I feel it even now just writing this out. The hairs on my arm are standing up. 
That creature had yellowish amber colored eyes that literally glowed like they had a power source behind them. We later discussed this and we believe that it may have been caused by the light from the huge bonfire we made. The beast then growled and it was so deep. We all felt it in our bones. I mean, I felt it in my chest and when I looked at my two buddies, they said that they felt lightheaded and sick suddenly. That thing then did something so shocking, so alien to the status quo, that we immediately felt in danger, running inside the building and up two sets of broken, missing, and falling apart concrete stairs up to the third level. We were all lucky we didn't fall and break a bone, or worse. What that thing did was stand up on two legs, its back legs. They looked like a huge set of dog legs, but its large leg muscles were more reminiscent of a bodybuilder, but possibly even thicker. Just the look of its massive body was unbelievably impressive and terrifying. One of my friends was crying he was so scared. When we got to the third floor, we had to smack and shake him to shut him up as well as cover his mouth. He nearly passed out from lack of air or panic or both. We hoped it had left but it didn't. After a few minutes, we could hear something climbing up the outside before entering the building. We first saw its shadow. We all froze, no one daring to make a sound. We should have dropped down out of sight, but we were so scared, we just stood there, motionless. At the very least, it had to be the size of a grizzly bear but to see a canine this big, it felt as if we were dreaming. But it was real. And it was only about 20 feet away then, growling and sniffing the air. Then we saw it look right at us. It knew where we were. It probably knew the whole time. Its eyes glowing, we saw it beginning to drool, but not a little. It was pouring out of its mouth, and I couldn't help but wonder. Was it imagining eating us? Did it want to kill us? It could have done so easily. But then it looked away from us and saw the stairs we had climbed. We froze again, a newfound feeling of horror enveloping us. It was heading towards the stairs to come up to where we were. We all began to freak out, and after looking around, there were only two escapes, an outside fire escape going up to the roof or out to the fourth floor. The part going down had long since rusted and fell off. As we considered our options, the creature hopped easily over the three steps that were missing and was now on the second floor. It walked to the next set of stairs and at that moment, we heard the most beautiful sound ever. A train was coming right by the building, slowly too. They must have seen the fire because as they passed, they let loose the train's horn. It startled the wolf creature, which then looked towards the opening of the building, and in just a couple of seconds it was out and gone. We all began screaming for help, which no one heard, but also we were just screaming from stress, finally feeling like we were going to make it out okay. When the train had passed and we could no longer hear it, the fear set back in, and we thought every little sound was that thing coming back. But thank God, it didn't. We began to make our way back down to the second floor, waiting 45 minutes, then to the first floor, waiting probably an hour before we ventured back outside. We thought for sure every second we were making our way back to my friend's house, it was going to come after us. We could hear the wild dogs in the distance, and we started to run. We ran until we got to my buddy's house. To this day, those of us in my friend group who are still alive and still in touch talk about that night. We're going to remember what happened, probably till the day we die. I'm still in awe that things like this can exist. Now whenever I hear someone's story about something similar, I freeze up and I'm instantly brought back to that night. The Ghost in My Basement 
from Poppy Gallo 22. I grew up in Salem, Utah, in the house my parents built. It was a rural town my whole childhood, but has grown significantly to the point that I barely recognize most areas. Since my family built the house, I never thought it could be haunted. That all changed when I was about 12 years old. Before the house stood there, the land was just a horse field next to my grandparents' home. Neither of them had passed away, so their spirits could not have lingered there. But I would like to share two experiences with the paranormal I had in that house. Story 1 The basement was unfinished until I was about 12 years old. When we finished it, my brother and I both got to move down there into our very own rooms. We shared our previous room. The stairs down started in the living room, paused at a landing, and continued going down the other direction, making a U-shape. At the bottom, you could turn left and go into the family room, or turn right and walk into a large landing hallway that gave access to our bedrooms, the office, bathroom, and storage room. My room was at the furthest end straight ahead, and my brother was the door to the right closest to the stairs. I loved having my own room, but I soon found it was hard for me to fall asleep, so I always lay in bed listening to music or the sound of crickets outside my window. One night, while just lying there waiting for sleep to take me, I began to hear someone walking on the carpet in the hallway. The new carpet made a shaggy crunch noise since it was brand new so you could hear when someone walked on it. It was past midnight, so I was curious about who was out there. I walked to the door, opened it, and shone my flashlight. There in the dark was my brother, walking around in a circle in the middle of the hall. I knew he sleepwalked, but had never seen him do anything like this. I called his name softly, telling him to go back to bed. It really sent chills down my spine when he stopped right there and looked me dead in the eyes. I knew he was asleep because he never acted this way while he was awake and he sounded like he was softly snoring. But his eyes showed nothing in them. No emotion, no thoughts, almost like a deer in the headlights. But without a word, he turned and slowly went back to bed. I did the same. It took me a while to calm my nerves and just relax. I was about to fall asleep at last when I heard the footsteps again. I thought he must be up again and decided I was going to have him go back to bed and shut his door. Annoyed, I got up and walked over to the door. But when I turned on the lights, the hallway was completely empty. It took a fraction of a second for me to realize that even though I did not see anyone, I could still hear footsteps on the carpet right in front of me. My heart stopped. I froze with fear. Then suddenly, the footsteps stopped too. I stood there, rooted to the spot, just waiting for something to lunge out at me or to make some kind of noise. But nothing happened. I walked over with my hand outstretched to see if I could feel anything. Nothing. I peered into my brother's room to find him still sound asleep in his bed. I quickly went back to bed and closed my door. Then I put headphones in, praying I would not hear anything again. I didn't, but I will never forget the sound of footsteps in front of me in an empty hallway. Story 2 When I was in high school, I always got home before anyone else. This was because my school ended before anyone else got to leave work or school. I would walk home and get inside through the garage door. From there, I would use a door that opened up into the kitchen. As you enter, you get a good look at the staircase that leads to the basement. I was used to being alone for at least an hour before my parents and siblings would return from work and school. One day, I remember opening the door to the garage, looking towards the stairs 
as I took my first step inside. My blood ran cold as I locked onto movement on the staircase landing. A tall man, wearing Levi overalls, a buttoned-up shirt, and a leather hat, walked from the center landing down into the basement. He looked older, had a tanned, weathered face, and some gray bristles on his cheeks and chin. He took two or so steps before I broke out of my stupor. I yelled at him. Hey, who are you? What are you doing here? Get out! He did not acknowledge me. He just walked down the rest of the stairs, just a slow pace that felt like he didn't have anywhere in particular to go. I was filled with the need to defend my house and get this guy out, so instead of going to find help, I ran to the knife set in the kitchen, grabbed the biggest I could find, and ran down the stairs, screaming at the man, telling him to get out of my house. But there was no sign of him. I checked every room, every nook and cranny in the basement. He wasn't there. I checked the whole house. Then I checked the doors and windows. Everything was locked and intact. Looking back, I feel foolish for going for a knife instead of leaving and calling the police, since that would have been safer had there been an intruder. But I'm also glad I didn't, to save me from explaining that I saw a man who just vanished into thin air. I've taken to calling him the farmer, since that's what he looked like and my town was just a small farm town in the middle of Utah. I never did see him again, but I wonder if he was the one, the one I heard years before, walking around in the basement that night. Years later, I told my dad the story. He said that the description reminded him of his granddad. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but part of me wonders if my great-grandpa and other ancestors are still hanging out around their family. I also found out my brother had his own paranormal experiences that he never told anyone until recently. Those are stories for another day. But it's just more proof that that house may be haunted. I call him Jerry. From Josh. I'll be sharing with you three encounters. I think they're related, but I can't be absolutely sure. So I'll let you be the judge. My first encounter happened at Fudge Camp, which is a church summer camp. We went to North Greenville University, and we got the cabins right next to the woods. One night, we had to go to bed early, because we had the mega relay the next day. While I do have a disability that prevents my muscles from moving like a regular person, I still have a limited range of motion. It affects all my muscles and my eyes. This will be important. You see, I have to wear night chamber goggles. They block out all light. And I'm not really good at sleeping in general either. That night, I couldn't really sleep, which was usual for me. I was sharing a room with my friend, who's a heavy sleeper. I lay awake in bed when I heard the door open. At first, I thought it was my friend, but then I heard him snoring. I began to wonder who was in our room. Maybe it was my dad, but it couldn't be, because we had locked our door before we went to bed. Not to mention when the door opens, it makes this loud creaking sound. Then I heard footsteps walking to my bed. Then something pressed down at the end of the bed, like someone was sitting on it. I then got this overwhelming feeling of being watched, but I had my night chamber goggles on, so I didn't bother taking them off, I just acted like I was sleeping. Eventually, I felt the weight on the bed pull away, and the sensation of eyes on me faded away. The footsteps began to walk back to my door. The door slowly shut, and locked back into place. The following day, I asked my dad and the counselor if they had gone into our room that night, and both said no. One of my friends told me that he had a dream of a weird-looking animal from the woods behind our cabin, which came out 
walked into the cabin, and it went into one of our rooms, but he said he couldn't remember which room it was. I didn't bother saying anything, because I didn't want to sound crazy, but I knew I was fully awake last night, and I was certain that something or someone had come into my room and sat at the end of my bed, and it felt like it was watching me before getting up and leaving. Fast forward a couple months later to my second encounter. I had downloaded the game Pokemon Go. The first thing that it tells you is to always be aware of your surroundings when you play. One night, there was a Pokemon that made its debut, but the only time I could get it was at 12 o'clock at midnight, and it was right outside my house at the church around the corner. I got my shoes on and grabbed my phone, but when I opened my door, I got that feeling again, like something was watching me, like it was close by. I completely ignored the feeling and went to the church anyway. Before long, I was done with the stuff I needed to do on the game. I was about to head back, and that was when I heard a cat meowing. But what was different about this was it sounded like it was a record player being played back over and over. It was also across the road, on the other side of the field, that was solid pitch black. The only light post was the one at the church, and I was currently standing under it. I was on edge then, when the feeling of eyes watching me got even worse. Now, I was familiar with most of the cats and pets on my street, but this cat, this animal, sounded unlike any of them. This one was off, so it was even more strange and terrifying when it began to scream. I got back on my scooter and started on my way home. We don't have any wild cats where I live, just domestic pets. I drove down the road, and I could still hear it as loud as it was before, like it was chasing me and keeping up. I made it home in one piece, but I had no idea what that was. On to the third encounter. One night I was getting ready for bed. When I went into my room, my cat did not want to go in. I just ignored this. I was tired, so I just went to bed. I had a dream that night. In it was this humanoid-looking creature covered in red fur, like velvet, rather than fuzzy or fluffy. Imagine a short-haired dog like a chihuahua or short-haired cat. This creature came into my room, popping its head up and staring at me from the end of the bed. It had a human face. I could definitely see its teeth. It had lips too, and eyes, but not the typical scary monster eyes. These were blue. I watched it put its hand onto my bed and hoist itself up. The thing was much bigger than I expected, probably eight feet tall, tailless, and very muscular. It then leaned directly into my face. I reached out, placing a palm on its face. All it did was growl, like telling me, don't touch me. But it didn't attack. Steadily, a feeling of dread swelled up, forcing me awake. When I woke up, I felt my hand reaching out in front of me like in the dream, and I could feel fur, velvety fur. My hand was touching something, and that something was growling. I've never heard or seen anything like that again, and honestly, I haven't seen it in real life, but I guess I have touched it. If you know what this is, let me know. All I know is, not all supernatural creatures are bad or good. It seems like some are just there. The Other Girl in the Room From Mavy Wavy The following story contains an account of self-harm. I'm 25 years old, but this incident happened when I was 14. My mother worked for the government, so every three years she would be transferred to somewhere else in the country. I grew up with my grandparents, and my mother would visit whenever she could or we would go visit her over summer vacation and other holidays. The town she was in where the incident occurred was very suburban, but remote. She was put up in this old but huge apartment 
with about 10 of her colleagues and their families staying in the building. There were large tracts of dry land all around the building, and it wasn't unusual to find no neighbors for miles. I was with her for two months of summer vacation, and I was bored for the most part. I mean, there wasn't much to do there, so I would usually spend my days playing video games or watching TV. I did have a big room all to myself, which was great in the mornings, but as soon as it got dark, there was a very eerie vibe from the room that I just couldn't quite figure out. For one, it had this dark space in the corner where no light could penetrate, and I was just really afraid of dark places, but I shook it off thinking it was just my imagination and somehow continued to stay there. It was the night of April 5th, I'll never forget the date because what happened gives me shivers even to this day, nine years later. I finished dinner, said goodnight to my mom, and turned in for the night. I tossed and turned for a while, not feeling very comfortable, but at some point I was in a nice lull. That's when I heard it, sobbing, soft sobbing coming from the corner of the room. At first, I thought it was someone outside, or someone from the house below ours, but the sobbing seemed to echo off that corner. I sat up slowly, heart pounding, glancing at this dark space. At first glance, I couldn't make out a thing. Then, a silhouette started to appear. It was a girl. She faced away from me, cradling as her bony spine went to and fro in the dark. I think that was the moment I honestly forgot to breathe. Fear overtook every part of me, and I didn't even know what to do. I blinked once, thinking I was dreaming. When I opened my eyes, she was at the foot of my bed. She was pale and had scraggly hair. For the brief second that I saw her, before I screamed my lungs out, she had her head tilted, as though she were observing me, curiously. The next thing I knew, my mother came rushing in, turning on the lights and holding me tight. I didn't realize I was still screaming. The sound was just numb to me. As she tried to comfort me, I fell into a mess of sobs hyperventilating, still trying to make sense of what just happened. Some of the people in the building had heard the scream, and they came running to check on us. After what felt like ages, I managed to calm down a bit, and out of sheer exhaustion, I passed out in my mother's bed at some point. When I woke up the next day, it all felt like a dream. In fact, I was convinced the whole incident was a bad nightmare. That was until a friendly neighborhood woman came to visit my mother, checking in on us. While they spoke, assuming I was still sleeping, I eavesdropped. The woman seemed a bit on edge, her voice quivering as she told my mother that the people who had stayed there before us had a troubled daughter. The daughter was prone to violent fits and never really left the house. And well, that was her room, said the lady, pointing to my room. She sighed before continuing. That was where she hung herself. I was frozen, barely able to breathe. The woman's voice dropped to almost a whisper as she nervously told my mother, Yesterday was the second anniversary of her death. My mother gasped softly. As for me, I was still frozen numb, not really knowing how to process this. So I'd seen a girl in my room, the girl who had killed herself in there. My mother and the woman agreed not to mention anything to me, but it was too late. That girl sitting in the corner, sobbing, her pale specter in front of my bed. It was all etched into my mind, like a scar that would never heal. For the rest of the summer vacation, I refused to set foot in the room, even during daylight. And over time, 
the memory became a bit bearable, even fading to an extent. But the fear, oh the fear, it's dug in too deep that every fiber of my being feels it, even to this day. The Haunting on the Roof from Paranormal.pk The story I want to tell you happened one night at 3 a.m. I was getting ready to turn off my computer and go to sleep when I heard some strange sounds coming from my roof. At first, it sounded like someone was walking on the roof. Then it was like someone was using a hammer. And later, it sounded like someone dragging something heavy. I thought it might be my neighbor, so I went outside to check. But as I was about to leave my apartment, I again heard a loud noise, the heavy dragging sound. I realized it could be a thief stealing the outdoor units of my air conditioners. This had happened recently in my building, so I quickly grabbed my pistol and went outside to check. As I headed towards the stairs, I spotted my neighbor. He asked, Where are you going? Why do you have a gun? I explained to him that I'd heard a strange noise from the roof and was concerned it might be a burglar. He responded, Well, be careful. On I went to check, and I found the door locked from the outside. I unlocked the door with the key and opened it up, my fingers gripping onto the pistol. As I peered through the doorway, there was no one there. I checked on my air conditioner units. They were still there. After that, I returned inside, locking the door behind me. When I returned to my apartment, I sat on my sofa, my mind beginning to dwell on the recent events. Normally, I don't overthink things, but on this particular night, I found myself repeatedly reassuring myself that there was no one on the roof and that everything would be fine. However, a nagging thought persisted in my head, suggesting that the ordeal was not over, that I should remain alert. That feeling weighed on me, convincing me not to head to bed just yet. To distract myself, I decided to watch some YouTube videos, but I couldn't concentrate on much. I thought it might be a good idea to go check the rooftop again, just to calm my nerves. But before I could fully comprehend what was happening, I heard a noise. It sounded like someone running across the roof, and at the same time, there was the sound of someone rushing down the stairs. I grabbed my gun, opening my apartment door. When I was about to head back to the rooftop, I bumped into my neighbor again. But this time, he looked terrified. When I asked what happened, he explained he had seen a shadow from his kitchen. Curiosity had gotten the better of him, and he went out to check. He saw the shadow darting towards the rooftop. He followed it, but the eerie shadow mysteriously vanished right in front of the door. I started to feel more and more worried that someone we didn't invite might be on the roof. My neighbor was too scared to check, so I decided to be brave and go closer to where those strange sounds were coming from, even though I was getting more scared the closer I got. As I moved forward, I got those tingly goosebumps on my skin, my body's way of telling me something spooky is going on, only adding to my fear. When I got closer to the door, I saw that it was no longer locked. This made me check my pocket, confirming that I still had the key. Additionally, when I shone my light on the lock, I noticed there was no key in it. I opened the door and yelled out, Who's there? There was no answer, just eerie silence. As I looked around, I didn't see anyone but the silence was unsettling, and I could almost feel a creepy, cold sensation coming from behind me. I quickly turned around, ready to face what might be there, but what I saw was beyond belief, making my heart feel as though it might stop. A dark figure, fast and elusive, rushed toward the elevator room. My instincts took over, 
and I chased after it. But just as strangely as it had shown up, the mysterious figure vanished into thin air, leaving me confused and overwhelmed by terror. I stood there like a statue, until I felt a tap on my shoulder. Without thinking, I spun around and grabbed the person's arm, yelling out. But I soon realized it was the building's security guard, sent to check on me by the concerned neighbor. I immediately apologized. As he accompanied me to my apartment door, he said something that had me freeze in place. Funny you brought that gun with you, he gestured at it. I don't think bullets do anything to ghosts. My Haunted Doll From Smiley Albee I'll start by stating that I grew up hating dolls, especially the creepy-looking ones that you can give a fake bottle to, and it'll start making that suckling sound, along with the burp afterwards. I grew up without dolls, but my little sister had a doll that I wasn't too fond of. Knowing all the paranormal shows I grew up watching, I decided to throw that doll out once she grew out of it, or got bored of it. My experience with the paranormal grew with me as I got older. I am 28 now. At the time of this event, I was 22. With that being said, I was in for the ride of my life with the events I'm going to explain. I watched YouTube a lot, and there was a YouTuber I followed. As it was the month of Halloween, she was talking about her haunted dolls and stated that she bought one on eBay. If a doll calls out to you, it means that it's drawn to you, she said. I was scrolling through eBay, and I came across this one particular doll named Wendy. Wendy's story goes that she was walking home from school when a drunk driver ran the stop sign and hit her and sadly she died at the age of nine. When I saw Wendy, I was instantly drawn to her, and I purchased her for 50 bucks. When I received her, she arrived with a card from the previous owner, along with two small candles. She had an old white and yellow tinted dress that came to her knees, along with underwear like the old vintage kind an antique doll would wear with a dress and white sandals. When I took her out of the box, she looked like a regular doll, nothing out of the ordinary, but I didn't think much of it until further on. I lived in an apartment with my fiancé at the time, along with our cat, Pui, a sweet little cat that wasn't shy or skittish. So when Wendy arrived, Pui saw me take her out and rubbed up against her. Nothing bad about that, right? So I thought. I had cameras in my apartment, so I could check my phone to see Pui and if anyone was trying to break in. My apartment number was 1B on the bottom right. My fiancé and I worked second shift. He would leave around 1.30pm, and my shift started at 4pm. With the cameras, I got notifications of movement, and on one occasion I checked and saw Pui meowing, and I swear I saw an orb on the monitor but I didn't give it too much thought. Later that night, my fiancé said he'd found Wendy on the floor, and that Pui probably had knocked her over. No biggie, I thought. Later, I took Wendy to the bedroom and went to bed. When I woke up, I saw Wendy knocked over on the floor. I placed her on the dresser by the window. I asked my fiancé if he noticed her knocked over when he woke up. He said no, that she was still on the dresser, and Pui was asleep at our feet. I shook it off. While getting ready, I had Pandora playing. Out of the blue, my music stopped, and the app closed. Weird, I thought, blaming it on the Wi-Fi. That Friday, I cleaned the apartment and decided to take a nap. I had all my lights off except for a wax burner. I think I slept about three hours on the futon before I felt a gust of wind and a scratch on my face. I immediately woke up, horrified. My first thought was that Pui had ran by and clawed me, but the three claw marks on my face did not match his claws. 
Plus, he wasn't in the room when I woke up. I kept Wendy for about two and a half years and moved to another apartment, but we were in the same state. I left my fiancé for Stephen. Stephen moved in and said he wasn't fond of Wendy, but respected her. One day, Stephen was sleeping on the couch. At the time, I was pregnant and going to deliver soon. Suddenly, Stephen woke up, gasping for air, acting like someone was sitting on his chest. He woke me up with a scream. Right away, he blamed Wendy, that there was something wrong with the doll. But I said that was nonsense. Besides, besides, she wouldn't do that. He respected her, but he might have been right. I would wake up with scratches, but I never told him. I didn't want to freak him out anymore. At one point, my parents and sister came to get Pui and cat sit for a while, as I was going to be induced that night. My sister asked who the little girl on the balcony was, the one wearing the old yellow dress that stopped just above her ankles. I asked, puzzled, What girl? At this point, I was starting to think something really was up with Wendy, but she had never shown herself to me. I smiled and said maybe it was Wendy after all, coming out to say hello. An hour after that, we were talking about me being induced, becoming a mother, when suddenly I heard a low growl. I asked if my family heard that. My mom said maybe it was a neighbor dog, but no one next door had a dog. A year after that, while I was trying to move out, I forgot Wendy. I went back to the old place, but the door was locked. Apparently, management had already changed the lock without telling me. Only things left in there were an old bassinet, baby clothes, and Wendy. I don't know if they threw Wendy away, but every time I pass by that place, it appears the tenants there don't last, and the blinds are always up, exposing an empty apartment. It's been four years since I moved out. Not really sure what happened to Wendy. Hopefully she found a good home. If not, whatever's in that apartment wasn't Wendy. I believe whatever was using Wendy was trying to appear as something sinister. Luckily, Wendy is no longer with me. And now I don't buy that kind of stuff for the sake of my daughter. Stay off eBay buying haunted dolls. You never know what might attach to you and your loved ones. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at eeriecast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks, add free access to all our shows and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at eeriecast.com slash plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.